everything I developed a really good relationship to God and I love Jesus um, since I was a child so um, yeah and then three years ago 2020 we moved again and so while the COVID pandemic and we moved only a half hour away but we uh, changed church and because my mom took one a year off of work and my dad um, started working with students they weren't ahead of a church anymore so it was really different for me and my siblings to get into a new church from the outside and we didn't know anything and because of the COVID pandemic there weren't a lot of events or youth group and it was really hard for me to get into this church and um, it really didn't felt didn't feel right for me um, this church so it ended up that I only went to a church on Sunday but I went in a youth group or had like a Christian com community around me except of my family of course um, so this was a hard time for me for me because it was such a big cut in my life and um, but looking back it, um, it also was really good for me because it shaped my relationship to God because I prayed a lot in this time. I read the Bible on my own way more often and I developed to be more independent in my faith. And um, so my relationship got stronger to God. Um, and yeah, so looking back, it was had a positive aspect. And um, yeah, then... Uh, two years ago I met my boyfriend Johan and he brought me in his church and there was a really nice youth group so uh, it was really 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 good for me that I had like a Christian surrounding again to um, have people to co communicate about my faith and except um, so out of my family and yeah I loved it really much and I'm really thankful for that and yeah so and you can hear I love a big family uh, in a church and so I'm really happy to be here with you and because everything I can see is a big church family and I'm really excited to um, be here this year and this is not the only re reason why I'm here because after school I had to figure out what to do um, with a year because I don't didn't want to study right away so I um, reg realized pretty fast that I want to give God this year, that he can use me to spread his love and um, and that I can serve him with my whole heart because he had been so good to me my whole life and I want to share this with the world and give something um, to others from that. So, um, yeah. Um, I'm really excited for this year and I'm looking forward to meet all of you and I hope it was a little bit interesting for you to hear <laughs> something about me and uh, you are really welcome to ask me anything and um, yeah, if you want to see some pictures over there there are boards of knowing me and uh, I so you can look at that and yeah, thank you. <laughs> Would any of you like to ask Clara any questions right now? I'd love for you to feedback with her a bit right now if you have any wonders. Where do you think of Canada so far? So, yeah, I love it so much. It's really beautiful and really every peop every um, human we meet is so kind <laughs> and um, we, we feel really welcome here. So yeah, it's really nice. <coughs> Okay, awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Clara. You did a very good job. It was very impressive. Okay, so, um, I mean, you guys all fell in love with Sydney and Lydia over the course of the year last year. And, I mean, rightfully so, they were such delightful young ladies. Um, and then, 
you sort of wonder what what year two is going to look like, and obviously, like nothing is going to compare to Cindy and Lydia. You know what I mean? Like you just kind of have your mindset. And then these girls walk in, and they're they're so different from Cindy and Lydia, but they're so delightful, and they they love Jesus, and they're passionate to follow Him, and they're hard workers, and uh, and then you just sort of settle into gratitude. You're just so I mean, Steve and I are just so thankful. We're so thankful for what Cindy and Lydia meant to us last year, and we're so thankful to have these um, young ladies join us to give motivation and help us. Yeah, Maggie, tell me. I'm already preparing for a two year. <laughs> Maggie's bracing herself now for the emotional ending when they leave us and go back to Germany. So anyways, we're very grateful. Thank you both so much for coming. And I know you will enjoy the ECC community because we are, it's a very safe and lovely place. So. Okay, we're going to pray and then we'll move on to worship. So. Um, Jesus, uh, I ask right now, Lord, that you would captivate us. That each one of us would remember who you are. And that we would um, think back to the stories about you and remember um, how you treat people and remember how you teach and um, how awesome you truly are. And Father, I pray that from that place of remembrance that we would worship you well this morning. Um, and help us, Holy Spirit. We pray that you would enlighten us, Holy Spirit. Remind us of who you are. And um, remind us of what it's like to live in relationship with you. So we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and have your way. And then we also pray, God, that you would coach us and train us and teach us. That our minds would be open to being shaped by you today. And that our lives would be, that we would humble ourselves, submit to you, and have lives that are changed because of the things we learn. Um, we invite this, um, God, and we know, we recognize it's a hard thing to invite sometimes because change is hard. But we, we choose you, we choose your way, we choose your kingdom. We know it's better than um, our choices. And so help us, Lord Jesus, to submit to you. Um, we ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Please feel free to stand for worship if you'd like to. <coughs> Give me vision. 
Go on and scream it's 
ago because uh, the PowerPoint wasn't in the computer properly. And so we were like, it was actually really good, Jess, that you read that extra section. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> it gave us enough time to get to where we were supposed to go. How's everyone doing today? <laughs> that wasn't very convincing. <laughs> oh my goodness, are you that bad? Okay, so why don't we take a second? Is it okay to do this right now? Um, I'm gonna take, give you guys a minute to just uh, uh, circulate, and like if you guys want to like introduce yourself to somebody, just take a minute to settle in, grab a coffee from the back. And then we'll reconvene in like say two minutes and we'll get into the message. Is that cool? Can you guys do that? All right, do it. So stand up and go like say hi to people and stuff. Grab a coffee. You're saying hi when you're standing up. Sometimes um, when sometimes when I'm doing uh, sermon prep, um, there's not enough space within the prep to actually do or say everything. And so every once in a while, there's like you know scripture passages that end up on the cutting room floor, uh, as it were. And uh, so that's what I'm going to use the scripture reading time for, whether it's the passage we're going to study or it's a passage that I wish we could have studied. Uh, but just didn't uh, make it into the script. So I want to ask a question here. 
Have you ever noticed that cultural trends tend to be circular in nature? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Have you guys noticed that? Okay, good. Um, so we're starting to see the 90s and the 2000s coming back again. Have you guys, have you guys noticed that? <laughs> Did you have it? Well, if you get it out, you can sell it for a lot of money now. Um, so we're starting to see the 90s and 2000s again and how people are dressing. Uh, and music and movies and toys from that era seem to be making a bit of a comeback. Uh, and that is just brings me great delight because I am a child of the 1990s and sort of the 2000s. I was married in the 2000s, which is really crazy to think about. Uh, so I'm really more of a child of the 90s. Anybody else who's a child of the 90s here? Yeah? Woo! All right. Yeah, yes. So I noticed it first with my niece, Aislinn. How about the 50s? Uh, <laughs> Yay. Not quite, not quite. Uh, but, you know, that's great. Uh, I noticed it first with uh, my niece, Aislinn, who decided a couple of years ago that the early 90s grunge look was what she was going for. So she had like the, the ripped jeans, the big oversized like plaid shirt. Uh, anyways, I don't know what Doc Martens might be making a cutback, I'm, I'm not so sure, but she sort of started adopting that, that look and I'm like, huh, this is interesting, it's weird to see that uh, coming back. And then my nephew Elijah got like really heavy into pop punk from like the early, or late 90s, early 2000s. Any other pop punk uh, fans in the house? I know that you are, Aaron. Did you guys, <laughs> when you think about Aaron Simons, do you guys think pop punk, do you think Green Day? No. You don't, but it's in there, it's in, it's in us, right? Uh, and then Callum, he's into Pokemon, which is like this card game from like the late 90s. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, but it's, 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 there's no offense meant by that. It's absolutely, completely hot right now. Uh, and then like Charlotte and Ellie, one of the things that they love to do together is watch Gilmore Girls together, which is, you know, bizarro from like, the, you know, that early 2000s, right? And so, as we're raising, how many guys had mixtapes growing up? Like, you know, stuff right, uh, tape, oh, yeah, awesome, you guys are cool. So as we're raising up the next generation, uh, a lot of times we connect our experiences with theirs, right? So we try to relate to our, our kids and the next generation that's coming up by saying, hey, I remember being uh, a teenager too. And so we start like bringing these experiences and the music and like the fashion and the stories and the media and stuff from when we were growing up. And we say, hey, I know how to relate to you because when I was a kid, this is what we uh, what we used to do. And so we bring along these cultural relics of the past, like fashion and music and media. And it's kind of really cool because like, you know, now Calum's playing with toys that I had when I was a kid and uh, Charlotte's interested in, you know, Ellie's fashion and some of the things and the looks that they're going for because that was the same look that Charlotte was maybe going for in the 90s. Actually, what was your look in the 90s? <laughs> it's the same, it's the same as, it, as it is now, yeah. And so, uh, the, the cool thing is, as a parent, in this, especially in this era right now, is that everything old is, is new again. And, um, and so we've got these like weird little uh, cracks where we can sort of connect, reconnect with our kids. Mind you, you know, like digital culture versus analog culture that we grew up with, that's a little bit different, but we're trying to find ways of, of connecting uh, ourselves with our kids and our kids with our past really right and so we never really write off the past uh, but we reinterpret it for our day and age in fact certain things from the past they take on a new meaning in life in the day that we're living in um, and I don't know if you guys know this but um, the book uh, George Orwell's 1984 uh, you guys know this book how many of you guys studied in high school uh, so we studied that book in high school. Charlotte didn't study it because she didn't read it. I did. I read it, but I read it to Leticia when she was taking Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, that book was actually the, the second top selling book in the last two years, which is bizarro because this, this is a novel that was written in 1949. And so it's recirculated because the cultural moment uh, is now for that book to be, to, to kind of speak into what we're experiencing in life right now, right? Um, the old budget technique of cash stuffing, so you literally will take envelopes and you'll mark them for your budgetary 
uh, spending, and then you'll stuff that envelope full of cash, and then you take that cash out and you go make your purchases. And if there's not enough money in that envelope, guess what? You don't get it. Uh, so that whole technique is starting to make a comeback now, even in our age of digital currency, which is really, really bizarre. So instead of cash stuffing necessarily with envelopes, they have bank accounts that are set aside for certain things, and when there's nothing in that bank account, you're not doing any more spending. And because of our economy and the way things are financially right now, that technique, uh, even though it was like hot in the 80s, is making a resurgence now because of our cultural moment, right? And so paper bags, reusable containers, growing your own food, all these old trends are now being seen as viable, right? Because of the environmental concerns. So a lot of times we think of the past, it's like, oh, they're so wasteful, you know? But there's a lot of actually old techniques from the past that are a lot more uh, economically and environmentally viable today. And we're starting to rediscover some of those old ways, right? I wanna ask you guys, what are some old things that are new again? I know Charles is getting a knee replaced, so <laughs> his old knee is going to become new again, which is cool. Yeah, Aaron. I've noticed mullets are back. <laughs> mullets are back. Oh, yeah. Certain oh. things should stay in the past. No, <laughs> uh, what are some other things that are coming back? Mustaches, obviously, are another thing that's making a comeback. Yeah, yeah. I was in the Georgia Mall the other day, and there's like a retro store there, and they're selling elf dolls again. Elf. elf dolls. Wow. That's incredible. Our family watched Elf during COVID. That is, that is a blast from the past when you watch that. That's when you think about a show that probably should have been canceled, that was that was Elf. Um, what, uh, what other things from the past are starting to, you can see them making a resurgence. Joanne. I find myself making more soups for leftovers. There you go, yeah. making soups from leftovers. Yeah, like the whole idea of food waste. Uh, economically and environmentally, it's such a good thing because food waste is such a huge, huge uh, problem that we're, we're facing as a, as a culture. Canning? Canning's, canning's, big. canning's big. I try to go out and buy uh, canning jars. Is that, what they, uh, is that yeah. called jarring? or Is that still canning even though you put it in a jar? I don't know these things. I tried to find large ones for Charlotte and they were, like all, they were all sold out. So I had to, because she does pickles. Uh, anyone else? Things that are old that are making a resurgence. <coughs> Jillian, yes. Bell bottoms. Like Bell any bottoms. Bell 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 bottoms
And so, uh, and I believe that the Bible has a lot to say it, uh, uh, to us about the cultural moment that we find ourselves in. And we, I hope that it helps to inform our response to the culture that we find ourselves in. And so that's, that's the cool thing about the Bible that we have, is it's this ageless piece of, of wisdom that God has given us, that, and it helps us navigate our present day. And so 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, it's funny, this is a passage that my parents uh, encouraged me to memorize, because uh, that's my mom and dad, right? And it says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us uh, to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. And so like when we think about scripture in this context, and this is Paul writing a letter to uh, one of his protégés named Timothy, uh, he's teaching it uh, that scripture is one of the biggest motivating factors that will move us towards doing right in the culture and the context that we find ourselves in. So it, it teaches us, it teaches our hearts, it reveals our attitudes, uh, but then it will teach us and train us to respond to culture and to respond to these different trends in a proper sort of uh, God-like sort of way. And so there's a common temptation for Christians to use the culture to interpret God would have us think about cultural issues. So we, instead of looking at uh, the culture through the lens of scripture or through the lens of Jesus, uh, we look at scripture through the lens of culture. And that is, that is about as backwards as you can get uh, if you are a follower of Jesus. And so we have our authority, our authority is scripture, our authority is Jesus. And we are called as Christians to look at the world through the Jesus lens, okay? Not through the cultural lens. We don't look at Jesus through the cultural lens, but we look at it uh, through the Jesus lens. And I know it's really difficult because the culture is the, the water that we all swim in. And, uh, but we need to learn how to be thoughtful and to almost um, take ourselves out of culture to a degree so that we can look at things objectively. You guys understand? And so uh, there's a common temptation for Christians to use culture to interpret what God would have us think about cultural issues. And we want to move away from that a little bit. Um, so over the course of the next little while, we're going to be studying uh, 1 Thessalonians. And uh, the reason that we are going to be studying this is because God has placed this book on my heart. And I feel as though that it speaks uh, to the cultural moment that we're living in and specifically to... Uh, the cultural moment that this congregation uh, here at Elmville Community Church will be, that is, that we're facing right now. And so I just, I feel in my heart and my spirit, I sense that this is the way that we should be going, right? And so uh, the theme of this book is really interesting because your shirt has the, basically the three words of the theme of the book of First Thessalonians, and it's faith, hope, and love. So the three themes are faith, hope, and love. And so this book, uh, as we study, it's going to encourage you to live out your faith with love and hope in this cultural moment. So let's uh, take a look at the first verse of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, because uh, that's a good place to start, right? Uh, so if you have a Bible, um, there's a bunch of them that are around you. Uh, some of you guys like to use your phones, uh, so feel free to open up that book, and we're going to just look at verse 1. And we're not going to spend any more time, really, in 1 Thessalonians, because this is a background study uh, today. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. And if somebody has, like, the little NLT Bible in front of you, and you found it, can you yell out the page number? 905. 905. So those of you who've got the Pew Bibles, what do they say on the front? Truly. Adventure. <laughs> True Life. So it's the Adventure Bible. So it's page 905 in there. Thank you for that. All right. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 says this. It says, This letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. I just think that's super cool, first of all, right off the bat, that the letter is, instead of being signed at the end, it's signed at the beginning. And so we know who it's coming from, right? So that answers one of our context questions. Uh, who wrote this letter and who is it written to? So this letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And it says, we are writing to the church in Thessalonica. 
So it's got the, another another who there revolve uh, it right there in this in the passage to uh, to you who belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ may God give you grace and peace. So we've got a couple of big questions answered right from that first verse in uh, in this passage. So we learn in verse one that this letter was written to the church in Thessalonica by three people: Paul, we know him, right? Silas don't know him as well and Timothy we know a little bit more maybe about him than about Silas so just to kind of give you a brief uh, recap about those three guys uh, Paul was formerly a guy named Saul and he was a high-ranking Pharisee okay so he was in the Jewish religious system and he was a persecutor of Christians and what happened to Paul is as he was going out to persecute uh, in prison and put to death Christians because of their their faith expression uh, Paul had an encounter with uh, the the living Christ on uh, on a road along the way to commit more persecutions right and he encounters the risen Christ on the road so he has this supernatural encounter with God that didn't make any sort of sense in kind of the context of you know, the sensory world. Uh, in fact, he was struck blind and he had to be like guided out of that area. And he had some other miraculous encounters that just changed the course of his life. How many of you guys, and I, I know that some of us come to faith uh, through our minds, okay? Some of us come to faith uh, through our hearts. It just something in us resonates with uh, the message of truth that comes to the gospel. But then some of us have these supernatural encounters with God that make zero sense and it's like God kind of flips the switch and then all of a sudden you're encountering this entire new world and you don't understand what's really happening around you. How many of you guys have had those like supernatural experiences with God where you're like, I don't know where that came from, but whoa, that's changed my life. That's really cool. All right, I'm thankful. Thank you guys for sharing that. So we all have different ways that we encounter, that we encounter God. Some of us, it's again, like I said, it's more of a cerebral mental sort of curiosity. Some of us, it's like an alignment with our hearts. And then some of us, it's like this God sort of tackles us and he takes us out of the equation and then he said, shows himself to be real. So uh, we all come to Jesus in very different ways. And for Paul, he encounters Jesus supernaturally and his life changes like dramatically and his name changes as a result as well. And so Paul spent the rest of his life after that encounter with God as a missionary and a church planner. And so he traveled from city to city telling people that Jesus had come to give his life for them. He shared the gospel wherever he went. Okay, so that's the first dude, okay? So Paul and a lot of the New Testament, so uh, the later portions in our Bible, a lot of those uh, books are written by Paul. And so his life, again, changed very dramatically. Silas is another guy. Uh, that this book to the Thessalonians was written by. And he was chosen to accompany Paul on his second missionary journey after Paul and Barnabas parted ways. So how many of you guys know sometimes it's hard to get along with people? <laughs> like, honestly, even Christians, sometimes we have disagreements and fights, and sometimes those things are so harsh that you end up having to part ways. And so Paul and Barnabas, they had a missionary journey together, and so they went out and they preached the gospel. But then he, uh, Paul and Barnabas ended up having like a very, very strong disagreement where Barnabas <coughs> continued on missionary journeys with a guy named John Mark. And then Paul was like, well, I guess I'm not going with him anywhere. Uh, and so he was chosen by the other apostles, this guy named Silas, to accompany Paul on his missionary journeys, right? And so um, Acts chapter 15, uh, verse 32, tells us that's uh, Silas. Uh, he had been chosen because he had certain giftings that were helpful to Paul on these missionary journeys. And so uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 32 says this, uh, Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers. And so here we have Silas, and he's been cho chosen, why? Because he's got some prophetic giftings, and he's also got some uh, proficiencies in sharing the message of God uh, to people. And so he was a good public speaker. And so Paul, as he's on this journey, he needs somebody like Silas to kind of step up and help him, right? And, the, and then there's uh, Timothy, okay? So, so while, while Paul and Silas 
were on their missionary journey together, they met Timothy, who joined them on their journey, okay? And so Timothy was just this like little bright light in one of the churches or one of the places, the cities that, that Paul and Silas had journeyed to. And um, Paul, he so boldly asked Timothy to join them on this journey. So it's like, you can learn about Jesus and come with us and share Jesus as we're on our way around uh, kind of the, the, the then known world. So uh, Timothy is this bright light, this uh, young man, this protege of Paul, who Paul uh, discipled and mentored. Uh, uh, and then he used Timothy practically in ministry along their journey. So this really cool ragtag group of three guys going around the world and, and sharing Jesus together, right? And so the three of them traveled and worked together and they preached the gospel uh, that Jesus had come into the world to reunite sinners with their God through his death, okay? And then in cities where people were receptive to this gospel message, uh, they established churches, okay? And these churches were simply communities of Jesus followers who were learning and practicing the way of Jesus together. And so this is the three guys that we're, we're talking about, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and this letter to the Thessalonians come from the three of them. So they each have specific insight into this little church at Thessalonia or Thessalonica that uh, that we're going to learn about over the course of the next little while. Okay, so let's learn about uh, Thessalonica. Um, so Thessalonica is the church where uh, the place that we're going to study, right? And it was a major city in uh, Macedonia, which is in modern day Greece, uh, right now. Um, and at the time, it would have had a population of about 200,000. So in the ancient world, that was like a big city, okay? So Thessalonica was a very, very big city, okay? It was a major Roman military port uh, because it was right there on the Aegean Sea and it was well, well protected. And so there was a, a major Roman military port that, that existed there and it was an outpost there for military, okay? And it was also a com uh, an important commercial port on the Aegean Sea. Um, so a lot of things from the east would have come through the port at Thessalonica, and then it would have traveled through to the rest of Europe, okay? And so there was this really interesting, it was a, it was a wealthy city, uh, but it was also a very culturally um, unique city because it had influences not just from the East, so the Middle East and Eastern Europe, but it had influences from Western Europe as well. So there was this road, it was a shipping port, and there was a road that came across from uh, the Aegean Sea through Thessalonica to the Adriatic Sea, uh, which would have serviced Europe. And this is very boring for all of you. <laughs> so Thessalonica became a cultural hub uh, where Roman culture and Asian culture collided. Okay, So it was a really strategic place for the gospel to be shared, uh, as we're going to see in a moment. And so uh, we read uh, about how Paul, Silas, and Timothy came to plant a church in uh, Thessalonica in the book of Acts. So if you guys have your Bibles again, uh, if you could turn there to Acts uh, chapter 16. And maybe again, somebody who has a Bible that's from the pew that has a page number can yell at it. 844, you win the Bible sort of contest thing. So Acts 16, eight, page 844, Acts 16, verses 6 to 10. Oh, then 845. 845. Okay, so 845. Next page. And so it says, next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. So this is a really important thing, okay? So these guys are going around and they've made plans of where they want to go and travel to all the different cities that they want to, you know, share Jesus with. And it says this, the Holy Spirit prevented them from preaching the word of God in the province of Asia at the time. And then it says, then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. Then it says, but again, the spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. Okay, so there's, it's really interesting, right? Uh, because there's obviously some spiritual sensitivity in this group of, of guys. Because uh, quite often, if we make plans to go somewhere, you know, it's, you know, come hell or high water, we're, we're completing those plans, right? And a lot of times in ministry, that's what we do, is we, we've made plans to do this thing, and so we're just going to go for it because we feel very strongly that God wants us to do these things. 
But in this passage, uh, Paul and Silas, they are uh, approached by blockages. They're not able to kind of get through. There's something that's preventing them from getting in there. And then verse 8, it says, So instead they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. And then verse 9, it says, That night Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided, and I love how it says we there. Uh, so this is likely Luke is with them on this uh, journey because he's the guy that authored uh, the book of Acts. It says, so we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. And I think that's, this is really cool. So there's a combination of uh, their plans and their desire and their effort but then there's like this spiritual sensitivity uh, to where God was actually trying uh, to lead them, right? And I'm humbled by the sensitivity that Paul and Silas had towards the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes you, uh, if you face opposition, sometimes you think, well, that's a closed door, right? And I'm not going to go there. Or sometimes like, you know, things don't gain traction of the way that you do. And so you think that's a closed door there as well. But sometimes we don't sense where where the other opportunity is, is, is finding itself, right? And so Paul and Silas uh, encountered roadblocks in their calling to preach the word of God in Asia, which was, would be, if you remember that map, more to the east, right? So they're focused right, right on the middle between Asia and Europe, or the province of Asia and Europe, not Asia like we know Asia. It was a Roman uh, province at that time. So instead of pushing through, they discerned it at God's guidance. And so after seeing this vision, Paul Silas, and Silas ended up in Philippi for a short while. And here's the funny thing. If you look at Acts chapter 16, um, so Paul has this vision of the man of Macedonia, so verses 6 through 10. And then so people come to Jesus uh, that were really prominent in Philippi. And so it's like, yay, good things are happening, that's great. And then you look at verse 16, and then all of a sudden Paul and Silas are in prison. They've been beaten, and they, the people want them to leave, right? And so, like, here's a man of Macedonia that's saying, you know, come and come join us, and we're going to, you know, we need you to help us. And so then there's a little bit of opportunity that happens where people are, are, are coming to faith, but then major opposition happens to the point where they're getting beaten up physically, thrown into prison, and then basically being run out of town. So does that sound like the work of God? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Would God beckon me to go to some place where my life is actually in danger? Or is that like a closed door, right? So here's the thing. I think sometimes we're a little bit light. You know, We're a little lightweight as Western believers because as soon as we encounter any sort of opposition, we, we shut up shop or we're so stupid that you know where there is no uh, no opportunity we keep on barreling through even though uh, even though that's not where the Spirit of God would have us be okay so there, this is a really really interesting balance to um, to strike here uh, the balance between knowing what God wants you to do but then also being sensitive to the Holy Spirit as to his timing and that also, like, when you encounter opposition, not to write that off as God is not blessing this, but to actually continue pushing through with it. Uh, so it's really, really, like, these guys, obviously, Paul, Silas, and Timothy had this incredible sensitivity to what God had, would have them do because they had been spending time with them, right? And he was able to give them strength even in the midst of all of that. Yeah, sure. So I, I hear what you're saying, and I like it all, and I agree with it all, but I also feel like it's actually super encouraging that they didn't really know what to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's like they had the super sensitivity, but they also were floundering and had no idea what to do. And that feels encouraging because it's nice that this is Paul we're talking about who saw Jesus face to face and had his eyes covered over with scales and couldn't see for three days. And you know what I mean? Like, the story is so intense. And so you just imagine him having this, like, perfect little he and Jesus relationship where he always knows what he's supposed to do. Yeah. But well, actually, like, go, go to such and such a guy on Street Street or whatever, and, like, he's going to yeah. share everything with you. It's like, it's almost like his life was automated and God had it all, and now he's like, I have yeah. no idea where I'm supposed yeah. to go, right? Which feels good, because we often feel like that, right? How many of you guys feel relieved by that, that the Apostle Paul kind of got a little bit confused, maybe, as along, along the way, right? Yeah. And that things maybe aren't as road mapped out for us. It's a little bit more, uh, 
organic, as Rick Ma would call it. Okay. All right. So let's. Uh, so how, like, how would they know that uh, they were not supposed to go into those other areas beforehand? Yeah. Exactly. It's, well, it says the spirit of God yeah. kept them from doing so. So we don't know. I mean, like, what kind of hardships could they have faced that? Okay, the spirit says no, and then but okay, go here. And yeah. Go well, maybe instead of being <laughs> being beaten and imprisoned, maybe they would have been killed there. Who knows, right? Like, uh, you see, God knows. But we don't, right? And so when the Holy Spirit prevents you from doing something, you, you need to maybe take notice about that. You know what I mean? Like that's what I mean, like what's prevent? Exactly. Yeah. But we don't know. Like that's that's an interesting thing is that scripture is silent as far as like what that actually looked like. You know? Yeah. Kind of cool. Alright. Let's keep on moving. So we're gonna go to Acts 17 now. And this is the story of Paul and Silas in Thessalonica. And it was just so easy for them. <laughs> Verse 1, it says this. Paul and Silas then traveled through the towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service, and for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. So this is Paul's way, right? He, he preaches to the, the Jews first and then to the Gentiles, okay? And it says, he explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. He said, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. So obviously there's some wisdom and some decent speaking and like some intellect behind Paul for him to be able to present these things to this church here. And it says, some of the Jews <clears throat> who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. So here you have, in this town of Thessalonica, you have some Jewish people, some Gentile people, and some prominent people who are joining Paul, and you're like, we're all about this. We're all about this Jesus person you're talking about. We want to give our, our lives to them. So there might be some intellectual stuff that's causing them to go along with Paul sometimes, maybe it's an alignment of the hearts, but I imagine that in this crowd there would have been some supernatural encounter with the living God that would have caused them uh, to want to join Paul and Silas in this. So like in Philippi, Paul and Silas encounter several people who are receptive to the gospel from a wide range of backgrounds. And when God is at work, um, you guys know this, when God is at work, what happens? Good things, but also some bad things happen as well. So the enemy will discourage. And so we need the wisdom to know the difference between God's guidance and Satan's opposition. So let's look at verse 5. It says this. Um, so you got a group of people who are all excited about Jesus, and then some people who are quite upset about what Paul's doing, right? It says verse 5, but some of the Jews were jealous. Why, why do you think they were jealous? I think their message is old. Yeah, their message they have is nothing new to say or they, nothing important to say. They have nothing new to say. Maybe it's like their synagogue is now, you know, half the size that it used to be, right? And so they they felt like they had ownership over the people that were in that synagogue, and now they're following this different way, right? So, but some of the Jews were jealous, so they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and started a riot, which is like. <coughs> How wussy is that of them, right? It's like, we're not going to, you know, form a mob ourselves. We're going to uh, rile up some other people to form a mob against uh, Paul and Silas, right? And it says this, Then they attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas so they could drag them out to the crowd. So it sounds like fun times, right? Like, thank you, man from Macedonia. I got our butts kicked in Philippi, and now there's a mob at the door of the house that we're staying at, and they want to... They want to beat us up now, too. It says, not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers instead, and they took them before the city council. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, they shouted, and now they are here disturbing our city, too. And Jason has welcomed them into his home. They are all guilty of treason against Caesar, <coughs> for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. So, okay, I got a question. As far as the legal implications of what's happening to Jason and these friends here, and perhaps to Paul and Silas, is this serious, as in really, really bad, or is it like pretty minor, like a parking ticket? 
You're, you're getting charged with treason, okay? You're being charged with treason. And in, in the Roman Empire, that would have meant death to you, okay? And that says verse 8. And so here's Jason. And who's Jason? What? Sorry? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, but Jason, he's a new convert, right? So he's just joined along with Paul and Silas on this journey of knowing Jesus. And there's other new believers in this household as well. Um, from what we know about Thessalonica, Paul only stayed there maybe like six weeks. Okay? And so these, these guys are pretty darn fresh. All right? Um, and so the people of the city, as well as the city council, were thrown into turmoil by these reports. So the officials forced Jason and the other believers to post bond, and then they released them. So posting bond means you're going to have a trial later on down the road, right? So I want you to imagine for a moment that you are Jason or one of the new believers that's in his household, right? And so you've encountered the gospel. You've encountered this guy named Paul and, and, and Silas. They've told you a lot of new things about Jesus. And then all of a sudden you've got a mob banging down your door and they're wanting to drag you out, either beat you or put you on trial. How are you feeling about Jesus now? Pretty good. Are, are you? Are you? Or are you like, oh, did I just make a big mistake with, with my life, right? Because stuff is happening. Like, I wasn't being bothered by mobs before. And now that I'm following Jesus, there's a, an angry mob at my door, right? And so you are in trouble with all sorts of different wings of culture, okay? You're being persecuted by the Jews uh, who are raising suspicions against you. So some of those believers maybe in Jason's house were from the synagogue, and now all those people who were brothers and sisters to them are turning their back on them and wanting to, you know, cause trouble for them, right? And you're being thought of as treasonous by the Romans for having a different king. Now, remember, what is Thessalonica? It is a major military outpost. So there's a port there, and there's a, a military outpost there. So there's a little bit of firepower behind uh, the Romans and the Greeks who are, are coming against them. Yes, Mike? Uh, I think when I read this and listen to this story, it kind of goes along with your theme, what is old is new again. I, I think this is a very good example of cancel culture. Okay, yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And so you're being thought of as treasonous by the Romans for having a different king. Absolutely, Mike, you're, you're right. And on top of this, you're in actual legal trouble. It's not just like, it's not just like people are angry at me, oh no. There's actually like major life implications for the things that you're facing, right? And so I want to ask the question, are you sticking with it? Or are you going back to your old life? Because you've probably got a temptation here. Right? It's like, do, am I going to stick with this Jesus bit, uh, even though it's getting me in a world of trouble? Or am I going to go back to where things are safe and there's not mobs at my door, right? Um, does your allegiance to culture trump your allegiance to Christ? Does your allegiance to culture trump your allegiance to Christ? Uh, whose authority do you ultimately bow your knee to? And like, this is a really interesting story for... Uh, for our current day and age, right? And so we are kind of standing on some the precipice of a, a lot of different cultural movements, and we need to understand: okay, how are we gonna how are we gonna navigate these things? Uh, are we gonna stay strong in what we believe, or are we gonna, you know, bow our knee? Um, all right, so let's keep on going here. Uh, so, the gospel had so impacted these new believers that they were willing to risk their well-being for it. So they endured opposition and persecution for Jesus who they just met. And when you read through the book of 1 Thessalonians, like, a horrible persecution broke out against the church there. Uh, people were losing their lives because of Jesus. And then there was some concern because they hadn't had the theological sort of training and upbringing to understand what would happen with these believers after they died. They didn't, they didn't learn that part yet in the catechism, okay? And so uh, it's a very, very uh, interesting sort of story, right? And so they endured opposition and persecution for Jesus, who they just met. And so after posting bond for Jason and the believers, the little fledgling church at Thessalonica uh, did what they could to protect Paul and Silas. 
So verse 10, it says this. That very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. Um, so they're like, okay, we need Paul and Silas to be okay. Even though we're being persecuted, we need to preserve them because we believe that they're bringing the words of life to the world and the culture that they're living in. So we need to surround them, protect them, send them on their way so that message that we've received can continue to grow and continue to shed light to the world that, uh, that they were living in. So the believers at Thessalonica saw the beauty of the gospel and did what they could to preserve it. So they sent Paul and Silas away to an area that was less volatile. volatile. But when you read actually uh, Acts chapter 17, uh, the Jews from Thessalonica stirred up trouble even there in Berea because it was just a short distance away. So Paul then had to leave the area again, but then he left Paul and or Silas and Timothy to encourage the believers in that area and grow strong in their faith. So even though Paul, a lot of times we think Paul, he's the great church planner, it was actually Silas and Timothy that did a lot of the work in that church at Thessalonica uh, that we're going to be reading about. And uh, it's really cool how these two young believers, uh, Silas and Timothy, how they were able to um, disciple this little church so that it grew strong even in the face of adversity, right? And they, this uh, church ended up continuing very strong in their faith. And so as we close today, there are three themes. Again, as I said, you can just look at her shirt, faith, hope, and love, okay? And the key verse is 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 3. For the entire book of 1 Thessalonians, uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 3, it says this, As we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to be focusing on, okay, how do we, how do we grow our faith? Um, what is our faith supposed to look like in the culture that we're living in? How do we do those loving deeds that God has called us to? And how do we establish our hope, not necessarily in our security here on this earth, but in uh, our eternity with Jesus uh, in the future? So uh, the key theme for this entire, uh, this entire series is on the bottom of your screen there. And it says this, following Jesus produces a countercultural or holy way of life that responds to hostility with love and generosity and is motivated by hope in the coming kingdom of Jesus. Cool, eh? So you guys looking forward to it? I am. You're allowed to. Looking forward to it. That's okay. Especially if it makes me happy. Right? Um, anyway, so some really cool lessons that we can pull from uh, Paul, Silas, and Timothy in here as far as navigating a culture and not really knowing which end is up. I think that's really important for us uh, to, to know that we don't have to have it all figured out and everything that we know doesn't need to be rigid uh, because we need to learn how to be thoughtful and discerning as well uh, in the culture that we live in. Um, and sometimes we think that we should respond to certain things in a certain way, but uh, maybe there's a different model for us uh, in the way that we respond to things with grace instead of hostility. Um, yeah. So, does anybody have any thoughts or questions before we move on? Margaret? So, when we bring in, when, when you're away, we bring in a guest speaker and everybody sort of, you know, goes along. So, how, does, how did that work in those days that there was the house groups that were new believers in Jesus, but how did they end up in front of, like, in that picture, a huge crowd of guys that are just there to... Did they pay them to come and speak, or how did... Oh, you mean like who taught the believers? Well, no, Is that what you're asking? Right, but in, in the picture you see that there's a whole bunch of dudes that all, they're all in their outfits and whatever, and um, Paul is preaching to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how did they approve him coming to preach if, if they weren't sure about his message? Yeah, I know, I don't know. Uh, well, because he still had his... Uh, like, you mean at the synagogue, right? Uh, because he still had his credentials as a, uh, as a rabbi or a teacher. Uh, so you would be able, if you were a visiting, traveling rabbi, uh, you'd be able to go to a synagogue and request to speak. And so then Paul would have used that uh, credentials that he had from being a, a Pharisee. He would have been able to use that in the different cities that he went to. And also him having, uh, being a Roman citizen would have really helped him with that as well. So the, Paul had some clout, let's put it that way. And so he used that clout for the, the sake of the gospel. Dave. When um, they said all through the world preaching about Jesus. Yeah. 
was it the Roman world? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's the then known world, right? Because the world hadn't you know expanded a whole lot like we have it today. Uh, anybody else have questions? Yes, Jackie. I just find it really troubling, you know, how they were persecuted, right? And yeah. I know it happens today, right? Because the world, it, it's just, you wonder why God doesn't just protect the children, yeah. right? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like even Paul, he was so significant and in such a big role, and he's executed. Yeah, all the apostles were right. killed, right? I know. Right? John. 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 Yeah. yeah. And he didn't have a nice ending. Uh, yes, I know, but there is there is precious in the eyes of the Lord are the, are the, are the, is the blood of the saints, and so God will often use persecution and hardship to actually advance the gospel because people are seeing um, something not only to live for but also that's worth dying for as well. All right, so um, in our culture where there's very little opposition. Uh, to us and very little persecution, like real persecution. Uh, yeah, yeah, we could say that. Yeah, we'll see. Um, but I, I think we've got it a lot easier than, than most areas in the world. Um, and I think, honestly, there is a lot more advancement of the gospel in areas where there is persecution. Like you can look at, you know, studies of, you know, the 1040 window, that window in uh, the, the, basically the Middle East where the gospel is prohibited. Those churches are growing faster than any <laughs> 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 Anywhere else in the world. I thought it would land heavier, actually, so I'm surprised. Anyways, the gospel is being, is being advanced faster in those places than anywhere else in the world. And people are, again, because they're having these encounters with God, instead of like a... Um, like powerless religion, let's put it that way, or like a cultural faith, uh, people are actually like really <coughs> living out the gospel instead of just like subscribing to it like they would subscribe to Netflix. Sorry to say that. Uh, Charlotte? And I just want to say that, um, you know, when you, you sort of question how's Jason going to react to this now, he's yeah. being pulled away and whatever, but like that was always part of Paul's message. Paul's message wasn't like, follow <coughs> Jesus and everything's going to be a okay. Yeah. It was like, it's, it, it, life is going to get crazy fast. Yeah. That, you know, we see it all through his, the epistles and so on, that he always talks about the persecution. And so I think, I think Jason would have been well aware of the pros and cons of, and then his encounter with Jesus is enough to make him be able to stand there, right? So, yeah. but I think sometimes we, um, we do live a watered down version of it all. Um, our own commitment, our own lifestyles. We give Jesus lip service. Yeah, the minimum we can give him, and then we expect him to show up for us, right? And it's like we just—I think he—I think if we're going to be the kind of church where we see impact, it's going to require more of our commitment to him, right? Absolutely. You get you get out what you put in. Uh, there's a passage in uh, Paul or Jesus had just talked taught about. You know, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. And the whole crowd disappears. And then Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, like, they've all gone. Why haven't you gone? And what do the disciples say? Where else would we go? Where else would we, we go? You alone have the words. You alone have the words of life. And that's the truth. Like, when we encounter that Jesus way, like, there's not a whole lot else that uh, compares to it. Uh, somebody, yes, Kim. So, um, in the Bible study that we did with... Uh, Lives yes. at her place. We were studying the book of Philippians, and before every Bible study, there was a video that we would watch, and there was this wonderful little man. I don't know if, like where he was from, but he had this like, thick, thick, thick European accent, and he says, "I pray for you persecution. Huh. I pray that you come upon persecution because it, it's like iron sharpening iron, right? It's that conflict that, that strengthens our relationship with God, and it stinks." to have to go through it, but I, I mean, he, he's lived in a place, very obviously he's lived in a place where he's had to live through that, that persecution, but he was so joyful. He was so joyful about Jesus that it was incredible that he'd just smile and I pray for you persecution and he's kind of like, oh. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> I pray that you don't pray for me. <laughs> thanks, Kevin. No, that's yeah. good. And there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. There really is. All right. So if that's it, anybody else have any thoughts? I, I, 
I know it's, it's weird for to open things up in a lot of different churches, but this is what we do. Yes, Steve. Uh, well, you just made a comment in, about how we need to look at the scriptures not through our culture, but rather look, look biblically at our culture. Yeah. And uh, I'm assuming what you meant by that was that basically the philosophy of the age is evil. And if we look at the scriptures that through that perspective, we'll say, like to me, these days, the scriptures are a wonderful ancient piece of literature that really have very little relevance for today. Yeah, yeah. That's, and so that's really what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, well, primarily, I want us to look at the world and the culture through the eyes of Jesus. Yeah. Because um, I think sometimes we can, we can read into scripture uh, what we want it to say, you know what I'm saying right now? whether it's politically or socially or culturally. But I think, for the most part, I think we need to learn how to develop the heart of Christ and discern how he would respond to culture and do so likewise. Do you know what I'm saying right now? Uh, because the way that he navigated people who were on the margins of culture or people who were uh, engaged in sin, It was beautiful, right? Uh, he, he angered the religious, uh, but he was a friend of the sinner, right? And so, like, again, navigating with wisdom and with the lens of Jesus, our culture. Um, and so there's a, lot more, there's a lot more thoughtfulness that has to go into that than saying, hey, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, we're right. You know, get with the program. Like, Jesus had a, a different way of doing things, and we need to, to navigate culture and cultural changes with the heart of Jesus and motivated, hopefully, <laughs> by his heart, right? So that's, yeah. Anybody else? Let's close the prayer, and then I'm going to invite Jess to come up and close this off. Oh, God, I feel like I've uh, opened a can of worms here, but uh, let's, let's do it. I'm excited about this. Jesus, thank you for your word. Um, Jesus, I thank you for context as well, uh, because as we... Uh, read about this church that Paul and Silas and Timothy write this letter to. God, we kind of have this insight as to what happened there and, and the sort of the, some of the things that they were encountering, God, as they were uh, learning and growing in their faith, God. And it's really cool that these people who had just met Jesus made some very um, spiritually mature decisions as to how they would live their lives. And I pray, Lord, that their faith and uh, Paul's instruction um, would inspire us to um, really put our faith into practice, God, and to start really looking at how we view culture and uh, asking for you to help us see it through your eyes, Jesus, and with your heart, Jesus, uh, so that we can respond uh, truthfully uh, in grace and truth uh, to the world that we're, uh, that we're living in. Um, so again, yeah, God, thank you for this, this message. Thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would, uh, by your Holy Spirit, uh, apply it to our hearts and our lives and our minds uh, so that we can think and act accordingly. Thanks, God. You're good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jessica, would you lead us? Jillian, it's so nice to see you. <laughs>